So, hi everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you and today's speakers to uh, yet another exciting Friday afternoon um, to our BPTB virtual seminar series. Today we have two treats from Jean Wei Lee, who's going to tell us about how DXDT shapes the regulatory genomes, and Scott Manalis, um, following um, Jean's talk, will tell us about measuring mass across the scales from AAV viral vectors to polyploid cells. Um, I could probably use up the entire duration of the talk introducing Jean and Scott, but instead, without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Jean. Over to you. All right, thank you, Sri, and uh, all the organizers. And I really, uh, you know, I think this is, has been a really fantastic series of talks. And I talk to, I tell my undergrad advisees that they should come here regularly uh, to to check out the latest biophysics research. Um, it's really helpful for them, not you know, uh, being able to go to regular seminars. This is really helpful. And today, I'm really excited to talk about our recent work on how the speed of a molecular motor, in this case, the RNA polymerase, can dramatically redefine a a regulatory genome of a cell. And I use this term regulatory genome, um, which was borrowed from the late Eric Davison from Caltech, and who used this uh, term regulatory genome to describe the DNA elements in a genome that regulates gene expression. Of course, Eric was known for his work to systematically mapping uh, these cis regulatory elements during C urchin development. And it is important to uh, keep in mind that the output of these regulatory genome is not just a binary or on or off switch of gene expression, um, but it rather it's much more graded levels of protein production that spans many orders of magnitude. So for, for example, this is an E. coli proteome uh, in rich media. And here, the size of each polygon corresponds to the abundance of each protein that the, the name is indicated inside the polygon. Um, so you just think about how complex this problem is for this regulatory genome to tune these 4,000 knobs of protein expression uh, across all these uh, different scales. And um, you know, if you have experience making a pie, you know it's very difficult to strike the right proportion of each ingredient if you don't have the right recipe in hand. And whatever recipe that works is reflect reflective of the underlying physics and chemistry for which we know a lot about for these individual proteins, but oftentimes not in aggregation as the case of the cell. And so my lab is very interested in understanding this very problem. And luckily for us, the, this optimization problem is something that evolution has solved over and over again. And the solution is all there encoded in the regulatory genome, which we can now begin to uncover. And so we and many others have been working towards de deciphering both why and how cells optimize gene expression. If we take a look at the lac opron, for example, um, lac opron produces three times more of the beta-galactosidase, which is encoded in LAC-Z, then the lactose permeates, or LAC-Y. But why these numbers, right? And I believe that if we're someday able to truly understand biology at the same mechanistic level as we do for physics or chemistry, and we must aim to one day be able to derive why cells need these ratio of enzymes. Uh, if we're given the biochemical properties such as KCAT or KM, etc., And there's a lot of uh, recent progress in this field. And to, in this talk, I will instead focus on the how question. In other words, how cells regulate protein production using their genome sequence. And it, there are at least two different ways you can think about the biophysics of gene regulation. Many of you are probably familiar with the thermodynamics model for transcriptional regulation. 
and in which the promoter can be in different states of transcription factor binding and the statistical weight of each state is related to the affinity of the transcription factors in its entropy and so on. This type of model has been really useful in describing the bacterial transcriptional uh, control, um, but after transcription has initiated, everything is about kinetics. Where you have these RNA polymerases that zip through the DNA, and you have these ribosomes that zip through the RNA, and many regulatory processes take place at this stage. There's no time scale separation often that allows us to use quasi uh, equilibrium approximation, uh, and we have to think about the kinetics. So, for, for example, the RNA and proteins would fold while these motors move along. And many proteins and small molecules can interact with the nascent chain that ultimately determines the fate of the RNA and the fate of proteins. And more so in bacteria, are these, the relationship between these two motors are even more intimate. Right? So bacteria lack the nuclear envelope. And not only can transcription and translation take place at the same time, they can physically associate and kinetically couple during transcription and translation. In other words, these two motors will move at the same speed. And many important regulatory mechanisms are built upon ribosome's ability uh, to modulate the fate of the transcribing RNA polymerase. For example, RNA, the, a, a ribosome can block two main uh, pathways for transcription termination by sterically blocking these uh, hairpin formation of the intrinsic termination, or by blocking the axis of this helicase row that would grab normally grab onto the RNA and then terminate RNA polymerase. Uh, this kinetic coupling there, therefore enables the polymerase to sense, for example, the lack of amino acids, which would stall the ribosome and in turn attenuate transcription by modulating the termination a hairpin formation. This also enables important mRNA quality control mechanisms whereby the polymerase um, that puts a, a premature stop codon accidentally uh, is then uh, leading to uh, uh, uncoupling between transcription and translation and allowing Rho to come in and aggressively terminate all transcription that have this type of uncoupling. Uh, so these examples illustrate, I think, the um, how transcription and translation coupling is considered a cornerstone of gene regulatory uh, processes in bacteria, and also it very uh, deeply influences how we think about their genomes. Um, but of course, we like to think about E. coli is everything, but of course, um, it turns out that most of the evidence uh, from coupling are indeed coming from E. coli, but it only represents a small island in this large um, bacterial world that has been on Earth for billions of years. And whether kinetic coupling is indeed occurring in most of these species is actually unknown, even for another uh, really widely studied um, mother organism, Bacillus subtilis. And so, so we're going to uh, focus today's talk on uh, the distinction between Bacillus subtilis and E. coli. And we actually stumbled upon this area um, accidentally <laughs> when, when a physics gra graduate student in lab, John Benoit Lalin, uh, made a very intriguing observation. So at that time, John had just developed a uh, end-enriched RNA sequencing, we call it RENSEQ, that allows us to quantify the RNA isoforms in a cell and also to map the boundaries of RNA with single nucleotide resolution. Um, and John was staring at his data that looks like this when you have sort of steps of RNA associated with peaks that marks the five prime and three prime ends. He noticed something really strange to him. He noticed that the stop codon of the upstream gene is really close to the terminator hairpin for transcription. And he was just learning molecular biology at that time, and he realized that this would pose a problem because the, the downstream ribosome uh, would in principle block 
this hairpin from formation. Um, and therefore would this, make this termination not functional. And, and, but he can quantify this really well that the polymerase terminates 98% of the time as if there's no ribosome behind the RNA polymerase. So that led to uh, this hypothesis of him uh, that proposed that maybe transcription and translation is not kinetically coupled in bacillus subtilis. And that would have really important consequences I uh, talked about in the introduction that would lead to a completely different set of rules for gene regulation in bacillus subtilis. So I'm going to give you uh, data that confirms these hypotheses and also the predictions that we made. Okay, so this is when another graduate student, Grace Johnson, joined this project. And we decided to use a very classic assay to measure uh, kinetic coupling between transcription and translation in E. coli and see if indeed those are happening or not in bacillus subtilis. And this assay is actually quite interesting to think about. Um, it's all based on a simple induction system that you can turn on transcription really fast by uh, IPTG. Right? So IPTG binds to the lactic repressor, making it up, fall off from, from the promoter really quickly. And it, then it still takes some time for the polymerase to transcribe through the gene, right? And so you, after you add IPTG, it would take some time before you start to signal, uh, see the signal accumulate over time. Uh, that indicates when the first RNA polymerase actually reaches the end of that gene. So afterwards, you start to see the transcript levels start to accumulate linearly. Of course, that's before RNA decay kicks in. Um, and if the ribosome is really close to the RNA polymerase as they're moving along uh, the DNA, uh, you should see the first protein products start to accumulate at the same time. And it's a little difficult to see the first protein in, in this case, um, but what we can do is that we can look at how the signal accumulates afterwards, right? So after the first RNA is made, the RNA accumulates linearly, and the number of proteins per RNA also increase linearly. So the whole thing increases quadratically. And if you extrapolate back uh, to uh, zero activity, you, you'll get the time of the first full length proteins being made. In E. e. coli, uh, Grace was able to confirm that uh, man, uh, many uh, years of work that shows that by the time the first full length RNA is made, the first protein is made at the same time. But this is not true for bacillus subtilis. And in fact, the bacillus subtilis transcription accumulates much earlier than at the time it takes to make the full length protein. And the, this delay in this case turns out to be around 40 seconds. And remember, these are the same gene that Grace was probing, right? That would indicate that it's not the difference between the genome composition, um, it's purely from the differences in their motors that are different, right? Um, and we also have shown that. Uh, this delay uh, between transcription and translation also occurs for endogenous genes in bacillus subtilis. So this delay could be coming from several different reasons, right? You could have a very slow translation initiation, or you can have a very different speed of these two motors that makes them uncoupled. Um, so to test these scenarios, what Grayson did was to truncate one of her reported genes by 3,000 3, nucleotides and use the difference in timing for transcription and translation to calculate the velocity or the speed that the polymerase or the ribosome would take to translate or transcribe this full region. And what she saw was that transcription is consistently much faster than the speed of translation. So we call this runaway transcription because the RNA polymerase sort of outpaces the, uh, the pioneering ribosomes. Um, so if we think about put these numbers into a cartoon, uh, this would look like something like this, right? So 
by the time that the RNA polymerase transcribes a typical length uh, of 1,000 nucleotides, it will lead to about uh, 360 nucleotide separation between these two motors. And that would have important consequence in that the RNA polymerase should not be sensitive to translation. Um, and that would have very different, um, that would set very different rules for co-transcriptional gene regulation, right? So I'm going to first talk about what it means for uh, whether transcription can be regulated by translation, right? So if unlike E. coli, the ribosome is far behind the RNA polymerase, that means that transcription terminators uh, are not going to be able to be regulated by translation, which is something that E. coli uses a lot in tryptophan operons or histidine operons uh, to sense their amino, uh, amino acid uh, availability. Um, so to see if this is indeed the case, uh, we then sort of went back to our RENSIG data. So remember, RENSIG is this end mapping strategy that allows us to map precisely where transcription terminates. Um, and we can systematically measure the stop codon to stem of the hairpin distance and ask how many of these intrinsic terminators have really short distance terminators, um, which would indicate that ribosomes are far uh, 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 trailing the ribosome, uh, the polymerase. So it turns out uh, more than 70% of intrinsic terminators in bacillus have this stop to stem distance that are less than half of the ribosome footprint. And this is quite different from the case in E. coli where uh, only a quarter of those are short distance. And this quarter of terminators actually has really low uh, termination efficiency. So they're crappy terminators indicating that ribosomes are probably interfering with their termination activities. So a lot of terminators are terminating without the ribosome behind it. And even for the ones that are out here where we have long distances between stop codon and terminators, we can force transcription or we can force translation through the uh, terminator and we will still get just really good termination indicating that there, again, there's no ribosome behind the polymerase. So I think most of the transcription in bacillus alphas probably happens without a closely uh, trailing ribosome. And this would explain uh, something that has been noted anecdotally, um, but the, it all of a sudden makes sense now that in bacillus, they tend to have very few or almost no ribosome mediated transcriptional attenuation, uh, but instead they use uh, riboswitches a lot, and they use RNA binding proteins to regulate their transcription uh, co-transcriptionally, right? So this sort of explains the different space of possible gene regulatory networks that are allowed between E. coli and bacillus subtilis. The other important consequence is that rho, this termination factor rho, cannot possibly participate in mRNA quality control. As you remember, I sort of introduced you that rho is this termination factor in E. coli that will grab onto nascent RNA that's not protected by ribosomes and use that to, as a control, a quality control mechanism to remove apparently transcribed RNAs. Um, but this is, if this is also happening in bacillus, that would indicate that you know, most of transcription events are not going to be productive because there's no ribosomes to protect the RNA from row binding. And this is indeed the case, meaning that row is prohibited from accessing translation, uh, uh, nascent transcripts. So for this gene, for example, PYCA, that grace know that uh, transcription and translation are uncoupled. If we delete rho, it doesn't really make much change in, in the expression, whereas in E. coli, this will lead to hundreds of folds of difference. And overall, uh, throughout the genome, if we delete rho uh, and look at the change in RNA level compared to wild type, there's very few changes. And GRACE could also introduce a premature stop codon by, uh, by design and see if that leads to greatly reduced expression level. And again, it doesn't. 
uh, indicating rho is not acting on this idea, you know, it would be ideal targets of rho termination in E. coli. And this is not, again, not dependent on rho. So if rho is not sensing translation, does that mean that rho is not doing anything? And it turns out rho is actually uh, quite important in bacillus uh, in terms of terminating. Oh, by the way, I should say that this uh, experiment also shows that there's no quality control for nonsense mRNA in bacillus alpha's. That's quite striking to us because uh, it's once thought that these uh, mechanisms to remove RNAs that has a premature stop codon is a universal feature in our life because E. coli has it. You know, eukaryotes have those in, in nonsense mediated decay, but apparently bacillus doesn't care. We introduce stop codons here and there. It doesn't lead to degradation of the RNA. So it's actually quite interesting to think about why uh, and how uh, bacillus is able to tolerate accumulation of these potentially aberrant products of transcription and translation. Um, so as I said, Rho terminates anti-sense transcription, um, but not sense tra transcription. And if it's not through sensing translation, uh, what it is. Uh, so it turns out that a Rho we think is guided by uh, cis regulatory elements uh, that are encoded on the DNA and not by translation. And, and this is one of exper experiments that we did to demonstrate that we can force translation through an antisense RNA. The idea is that if everything is encoded in that antisense RNA, it should lead to row termination. And that, that is indeed the case. And we see uh, almost 600 fold termination by row. And this is again, independent of translation. It's purely uh, governed by the uh, sequence that's encoded in that element. So I think it's likely that bacillus alpha's genome have evolved to avoid row termination uh, sequences. So these specific motifs that we have not yet found in sense RNAs, um, but they are evolved to not have those in, uh, sorry, to have those in antisense RNAs, right? So they would have uh, the antisense RNA is being prone to a row dependent termination, but not the sense RNAs. Okay, so then we, uh, in the end, we decided to ask, you know, we found that runaway transcription happens in bacillus, and we also know that transcription and translation coupling is happening in E. coli. Which one is the more normal one in bacteria in general? Right, so that's a difficult problem to, to solve because experimentally we don't have that power to survey all different bacteria or even selectively. Uh, but it turns out that we can use this signature of stop to stem distances uh, to get a sense of what might be happening, right? So the idea is that if for species that have many of these short distance terminators, I would indicate that trans transcription and translation are not coupled and therefore consistent with runaway trans transcription. So John then uh, made this bioinformatic plot and it, it took quite a while to sort of optimize um, the uh, calling for transcription termination because we, we have to make sure that we have very low false positive rates. Um, and after that, um, he was able to demonstrate that uh, for species that are close to bacillus alpha's like Firmicus, they have a lot of these short distance terminators that would indicate runaway transcription. Whereas species that are closer to E. coli, like most proteobacteria, have very few short distance terminators. And there are also some gram negative bacteria that have a lot of short distance terminators, but we, we're uh, sort of thinking about uh, if they do have runaway transcription because uh, the, uh, what's known about how transcription terminates is actually not clear. Um, so I think overall the bacterial world has at least these two modes of uh, transcription. One is uh, translation coupled transcription and another mode is translate a uh, runaway transcription. And that really leads to this different space of uh, co-transcriptional gene regulation that can happen. 
right? So in one case, E. coli favors uh, using ribosomes to regulate termination. In bacillus, uh, they have to rely on RNA binding proteins and, uh, term uh, and uh, um, uh, ribose switches to regulate trans transcription. And all of those are driven by a simple difference in the speed of the RNA polymerase, right? And it's not just the instantaneous speed, it's the average speed that we're measuring. And um, I think it's really interesting and we are, we are going to that direction to see what determines the average speed. And then on top of that, how does variations in that average speed locally would influence uh, further mechanistic uh, events. So uh, I'll, I'll close right here, end of my time. I think I acknowledge people who did this work, but it's really a group effort. Um, the kinetics measurements actually relies, relied uh, on four people in the 37 degree room at the same time, which is not possible at the moment. So we're trying to figure out new ways that we can do experiments in a more socially distanced way. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll end there and uh, take any questions. Um, well, thank you for the talk, Jean. Um, uh, we have a shy audience today. So um, waiting for more questions to stream in. I encourage all of you to participate and ask us what you're thinking. Uh, in the meantime, uh, a question from Rudra Biswas. Compared with the gene length, how far behind the RNA polymerase is the lagging ribosome in B subtilis? Is the lag significant for the kinematics? Yeah, so um, I think one thing that um, I have not really mentioned here is the initiation rate of ribosome. Right, so if initiation of translation is instantaneous, then based on the elongation rate measurements, we can sort of estimate the distance between the RNA polymerase and the ribosome. Um, and from, from our calculation, uh, that distance, of course, based on the difference in average speed, you would anticipate the longer the gene is, the larger the separation is. And so it's roughly uh, 360 nucleotides per kb of transcription. Um, you know, we also have evidence, pre preliminary uh, evidence that suggests that trans translation initiation rate is also somewhat slower than in E. coli. Um, and that would further add to that distance between ribosome and, and the polymerase. Great, thank you. So um, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask you a question myself. Sure. Um, so, so this no quality control result is really intriguing. Um, would you comment on how much it depends on the specifics of the nutrient conditions or the environment conditions or the history of the cells? How universal are these results? Yeah, um, so you're asking whether these uh, quality control may be condition dependent. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, we have not extensively uh, explored all different conditions, but uh, based on, um, I think two or three conditions like really rapid growth versus pretty slow growth, uh, we can see that these termination, uh, sorry, this um, premature stop codon has no effects on RNA level. And so, uh, so it seems like at least in these conditions, there's not an active mechanism to remove them. Um, you know, first bacillus uh, lives in very different conditions beyond what we are able to test in the lab. So there, there could be additional uh, mechanisms that are not expressed in, in our conditions. Great, thank you. Question from uh, Jin Yan. Why is uh, bacillus's ribosome slower than E. coli? Yeah, great question. So it turns out that what we measured, if I go back to that plot, um, it's not that the ribosomes are different, it's the polymerase that are different. Um, so if you look at the time it takes to translate the lax Z genes, uh, which are the same length uh, that we put in E. coli and cellulose, it's about the same time. So 78 seconds in E. coli and 77 seconds in bacillus. 
What's different is, is that Bacillus transcription is able to complete much faster. Um, and we think uh, we can go into depth on thinking why that's the case. Um, I think in E. coli, the polymerase uh, is regulated by the small molecule PPGPP, actually binds to the polymerase and is able to regulate the speed. Uh, whereas Bacillus antlers RNA polymerase does not bind to PPGPP. So maybe that binding is sort of slowing the E. coli polymerase down. Uh, and we don't think that ribosomes can be much faster or slower because uh, both of these species can double at 20 uh, minutes doubling time. And you do need a lot of ribosomes working at 16 to 20 amino acid per second to really complete, completely double the cell size. And um, I think it, it sort of has re potentially reached the limit of how fast uh, translation elongation can go. And I don't think it's to them to their advantage to slow down at this growth rate. Great. Um, one more question, and then we'll save the rest for um, informal discussions. Uh, from Nancy Ford at 1128, if you could slow down the RNA polymerase down in subtlest, do you think the organism would survive? Forced coupling of transcription and translation, that is? Or is it too evolved towards runaway transcription? Yeah, you can imagine that if transcription is slow, you would have a lot of read through of all those trans transcription terminators, which can be detrimental. And so we were actually very curious about this question. And we have been trying to isolate mutants that leads to slower transcription. Uh, we have not been able to find mutants or growth conditions that would lead to tra transcription translational coupling. Uh, so it's hard to answer that question uh, specifically. Um, I think uh, that's something we're very interested in and, and you know, uh, I think it would be really cool to see if we, we can or cannot force transcription and translation to be coupled. Well, thank you again for a uh, great talk and audience for enthusiastic participation. Uh, without further ado, we will transition into our second